It was early June, probably about 11 in the morning, I obviously don't remember, and I was spaced out staring into the forest trying my best to focus on anything but Donald J. Trump when this absolutely minuscule little raccoon just came out and started walking towards me. And even for someone as stupid as me, there are certain red lights that flash whenever you see a daytime raccoon, like certain questions that immediately pop to mind, such as, why are you awake? Shouldn't you be here at night? Are you sick? And now, looking back, I feel terrible for ever having questioned that angel, but in my defense, up until that point, the only other daytime raccoons I'd ever seen were in Toronto, and they were disgustingly sick. Like, if there were raccoon zombie movies, these would be the stars of those movies. They wouldn't even need makeup. But Larry wasn't sick. At least, she didn't look sick, and I'm the sort of man who gambles a lot on how I feel a raccoon looks. What's more, she was tiny, like a quarter the size of a normal raccoon. It wasn't like she was threatening me. It really did feel like I could probably take her. If anything, she looked like she needed to catch a break. Perhaps in her tiny raccoon brain, she understood that I too needed to catch a break, and we could be each other's, so long as we both agreed to the one simple rule of please don't bite me. And in case you're wondering, I am definitely the type of person who pretends that the reason Larry came to me is because I'm cool, and that she knew I would be cool. But in the reality that you probably live in, I suspect that you think the reason she walked up to me is because she was starving. In the bitter world of facts and figures, you don't think that I'm a Disney princess. I do sleep a lot, but I think that's the drugs. But Larry loves me for one reason and one reason alone. She loves me because I live on an island predominantly owned by Americans, and this year they can't come visit it. So out of 120 places, there's seven people here, and three of them are with me. So pandemic or not, Larry needs people, and there's no people. She might not be getting my meals, but she's all over my ingredients. She lives off of my compost. In fact, the population of virtually every creature on this island, from bird to squirrel to raccoon to beaver to duck or whatever, well, maybe not the beaver, but they're all reliant on the cottagers in some way. This island is simply too small to sustain any consistent population of these animals. So unnatural or not, if you take us cottagers away, pretty much everything here starves to death. And on that fine June day, I too was starving. Only instead of a lack of food, it was a lack of attention. And I know that sounds far less threatening, but you forget I'm a YouTuber. For us, that's way worse. Plus, months alone with my thoughts. Who likes their own thoughts? And let's also not forget that this was June, and everything pretty much fell apart in March. So I'm not ashamed to admit that I was in pretty rough shape, you know, up in the old noggin when Larry showed up. Uh, spent a lot of time on Twitter, which is essentially the mental equivalent of self-harm. I spent even more time complaining to my wife, who married me and is therefore locked into it. Uh, but I didn't want to be doing those things, you know? They were alienating all my online friends who didn't know I was a weirdo yet. What I wanted to be doing was sitting in the grass with a super cool raccoon. I just didn't know it yet. And maybe it was just the psychosis of the year, but from the moment I saw that little thing hopping towards me in my yard, I just knew I was gonna make her happy so that it would make me happy. And by the end of the week, Larry and I were hanging out at least an hour every day. She'd munch on some corn, I'd sit there, tell her how cool she was. I mean, you know, the dream really. Or so I thought, until a second dream arrived. We call him Baby Larry. Get this, he's Larry's baby. I don't quite remember exactly when Larry started bringing BL around. This entire pandemic has been quite the blur. But what I do remember is that once she did, she started letting us babysit him within two days. She just dropped him off wherever we were. We were picking mulberries and she brought him up in the tree, super chill, left him there for 15 minutes, just munching right above my head. And a few days later, she just did it again. I mean it with full seriousness when I say it was incredible. It felt like nature was giving me a high five with its awesome little raccoon hand. Who wouldn't want that? And so with our bond solidified, I started paying way more attention to Larry's needs. When it rained, I worried about Larry. When I saw coyote poop, I worried about Larry. And then one day I came home and she was dangling from this tree, super hot, panting, looking like she was about to die. And it killed me. But instead of just worrying, I realized I can help her. And I just want to take a second and know that Larry poops from a tree and it's hilarious. I mean, look at that. She could just be doing that on the ground. But nope, gotta do it in a tree. Oh, Larry. Okay, okay, sorry. Larry was hot. That's what I was saying. She was dangling. She was panting. I wanted to cool her down. Obviously, she was killing me looking so rough. But I also didn't want her to hate me. And wild animals, for the most part, and I know this is going to sound a little contentious, are stupid. 
If you want to solve their problems, particularly if they involve spraying them with cold water, most of the time you're going to want to trick them. And so that's exactly what I did. Operation Cool Larry was officially underway. To get the cooling basin, I stole my niece's pool. She wasn't happy about it, but she's five. What's she going to do about it? Her arms are real small. Plus, I'm lying. It was actually under my neighbor's house, and I just borrowed their kiddie pool. But it sounded funnier to say I took it from my niece and that I'm mean to her, which I'm not, because she's great. But someone who's equally great was Larry, because she fell for my trap pretty much immediately. She sat there for like 20 minutes on the first day, cooled right off. Not just one time on that day either, but a bunch of times on a bunch of different days. Operation Cool Larry was a complete success. Soon, I was so high off the thrill of bathing the world's smallest bear that I decided to build her a little office. Turn her into some sort of viral success, maybe. Baby Larry could be the intern, but she would be the show. It would be adorable, and even though I didn't really end up going that route, I don't regret what I did for a second, because sometimes you just gotta start building a raccoon an office. And seeing her every day for an hour or two led me to just start doing weird things, and eventually even start taking her for granted. Because all of a sudden I found myself thinking, what if this wasn't just a friendship with Larry? What if it was more? What if I could get a multi-generational bond going? You know, have her children grow up loving me, knowing me. I wanted to be that weird local guy who tamed raccoons, and all of it built on the back of this one awful year. Just, you know, to make up for it. And somewhere up there, ladies and gentlemen, somewhere in the height of summer, the sun noticed that newborn Icarus, and he started melting my little glue wings. And I came out one day, and Larry was alone again. She came alone, again and again and again and again, and then the coyotes had already eaten three of the four baby raccoons we'd seen, so I was hardening my heart, but I had to bid farewell to a real one, because B.O. was a good baby, but he wasn't coming back. And naturally, I held a funeral. Larry even came to see the grave. You might be saying in your reality that she came to eat the corn that I put on the grave. But that's the sort of semantics that you can keep in your side. She looked somber enough for me. Especially uh, two days later when I learned that BL had not only not died, but was completely fine. He was just a teenager now and didn't want to be seen hanging out with his mom. Which makes sense, I guess. But I'd been scarred. Scarred inside. The reality of losing Larry had set in like the shadow of winter, and one day I knew I was going to wake up and she wouldn't be coming back. And that hurt. But it's only by staring into the face of pain that we can begin to remove it. I'm certain that BL moving out on his own hurt me more than it did Larry. In fact, she didn't really seem all that upset, frankly. I think it was a combination of her being a raccoon and him not really being dead that did it. But what it did change was how it perceived my role in their lives. I stopped trying to build them these elaborate sets. I stopped even trying to coax Larry into sitting on my lap, although I would still take that in a heartbeat. But what I started to realize is that if I really loved this animal, the best thing I could do for her was trick her into having a better life. And what's a better gift to a new mother than a house, especially one that no coyote could ever reach? One that has your face literally burnt into the front. I call it Casa Larry. It even has a, get this, Casa Larry bird. The thing about her house is, though, I built it knowing full well that Larry's probably never going to live there. Raccoons are stubborn about their housing, and what's more, I know now that she's a wild animal. But that was never the point. Even as a home for squirrels or birds or hell, even if nothing ever lives there, it still served its purpose to me. I built the house for me. I built it because I wanted to remind myself of something every time I look in the yard. That yeah, okay, this year sucked because I lost control and losing control sucks. I couldn't do the things I planned to do. Hell, I couldn't even go outside half the time. In other terms, I couldn't domesticate Larry. I couldn't raise BL. They say to live in the moment, but that's not exactly easy to do. I know that if Captain Ahab had just piled a little corn next to that white whale, he might have survived with a great story for the bar. I know that Larry won't ever be domesticated. I'm not going to turn her into some viral star. I'm not going to raise her children as my own. But I have a new appreciation for how much we need each other. For how natural everything still is. Now that we're at the end of the year, it's pretty safe to say that 2020 was unredeemably bad. Uh, presumably for you, just as much as me, just as much as the average anybody. And yet, instead of lamenting that lost dream of a now dead version of myself, all I can think is, man, I got to sit in the grass with a wild raccoon. I think if I could go back in time, knowing what I know now, I would probably still choose the grass. 
Larry came into my life at the exact perfect time, and I hope she left at the perfect time for her. But I don't know what the future holds. Maybe she comes back next year, maybe she doesn't. All I do know is that if she does, I'm gonna be waiting here. And I hope she brings so many kids. This is Rare Earth. I hope your guys' year has been okay.